Well, this is Kevin Couture, cha Vice Chairman of the uh, Killing Town Council. We're going to op open the public hearing on item number 14A, which is a consideration and action on an ordinance amending Chapter 11 to modify the notice provision of the alarm ordinance. Would you want to go over this quick, Mary? For I can. Um, so this was reviewed by the Ordinance Subcommittee and also uh, reviewed by the Town Council last month in which you set the public hearing for tonight. This modifies um, the current language within the notification section for alarms and this has to do with security alarm systems for both commercial and residential. Um, really to basically be able to reflect how we actually receive notica notification from the state police on when there are actual false alarms. We get that on a monthly basis from the state police. Our current language requires us to notify individuals after every single false alarm. We don't have the capacity to do that simply because we don't receive that information um, except on a monthly basis. Um, so um, those that have alarms, um, either commercial um, properties or residential, when they register their alarms, they're given the whole ordinance which outlines what the requirements are for uh, fines and each time we send them a notification, we include that information with it. So this is to basically um, be able to mirror what we actually receive for monthly notifications from the state PD. Thank you. <clears throat> Does anybody here want to speak on this ordinance, Chapter 11 amendment for the, during the public hearing? One more call for anyone to come up for public comment for the amendment to chapter 11 and just so you know we did not receive any by written okay there's no written comments no written comments all right all right we'll close the public comment session of the public uh, hearing on item 14a we'll open the meeting of the killing town council at 704 p.m uh the prayer mr wood please uh, before we go into the uh prayer there i'd also like to take a moment of silence um uh, you're planning and developing uh, director who recently lost her husband there so just a moment uh, silence for him Heavenly Father again we are uh, grateful that you have given us all a heart of servants uh, servants to uh, those who have elected us, servants to the citizens here in this town, and even to those who uh, work here as well. Uh, we, we have uh, a heart to serve people. We pray that you would just continue to give us wisdom as we go about this uh, meeting, that you would guide and direct our conversations. We pray this in your holy and precious name. Amen. Roll call purposes, all members are present. Mr. Anderson is on his way, he's running late. Should be here within 15, 20 minutes. Um, have the adoption of the minutes from previous meetings. Everybody get a chance to review the minutes and see any corrections or omissions. Make a motion to approve the minutes of uh, the special meeting of September 5th, 2023. I'll make the motion. I'll second. Any discussion? Anybody find any errors? Or uh, I did find one on page 160. Just, um, it's just a minor typo there on at item number two. On roll call, all counselors were present. I said Mr. Wood instead. That's all. <laughs> <coughs> Any other corrections? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Adoption of minutes of regular town council meeting September 12, 2023. Motion to adopt. Second. Motion been made and seconded. Any discussion? Anybody find any errors? 
Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Moving on to presentations, proclamations, and declarations. Proclamation recognizing October 2023 as Down Syndrome Awareness Month. Whereas Down Syndrome is the most common chromosomal disorder which pro produces an array of challenges, health and growth concerns, including delayed language and development skills, Down Syndrome occurs when a baby receives a full or partial extra copy of chromosome 21. And whereas approximately one in every 700 babies are born with Down Syndromes, representing an estimated 6,000 births per year in the United States. There are over 400,000 individuals living with Down syndromes in the United States. Life expectancy has increased dramatically in recent decades, ranging from age 25 in 1983 to reaching the age of 60 as of today. And whereas possessing a wide range of abilities, individuals with Down syndromes attend school, work, participate in decisions that affect them, have meaningful relationships, vote, and contribute to society in their communities in many wonderful ways. And whereas individuals with Down syndrome should have equal opportunity to, to achieve the universal desired goals of self-fulfillment, pride in their achievements, inclusions in their community, and reaching their fullest potential. And whereas quality educational programs, a stimulating home environment, good health care, and positive support from family, friends, and community enable people with Down syndromes to lead fulfilling and productive lives. And now, therefore, it be proclaimed by the Town Council of the Town of Killingly that the month of October hereby be recognized as Down Syndrome Awareness Month, and be it further proclaimed, the Killingly Town Council supports and encourages meaningful participation of people with Down Syndrome in all aspects in society during Down Syndrome Awareness Month and throughout the year. Killingly Town Council, Jason Anderson, Chairman. Does anybody want to volunteer to wear breast skin? All right, Mr. Wakefield. Uh, proclamation recognizing October 2023 as Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Whereas breast cancer is the second most di diagnosed uh, form of cancer for women in the United States and is expected to be detected in one out of eight women in America every year. And whereas early detection is vital to ensure the most effective diagnosis and treatment possible and can save lives. And whereas it is vital to meet with your physician and discuss your individual risk, family history, and other common risks, preventative care, and regular screenings. And whereas researchers, scientists, numerous nonprofit organizations, and breast cancer survivors are dedicated to discovering the cure for breast cancer and providing education about breast cancer. Today, the five-year survival rate, 90%, or is 90%, and whereas all breast cancer survivors should be recognized for their determination, courage, and acknowledge that these survivors give us hope for a better future for those affected by this disease. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Town Council of the Town of Killamilly that the month of October hereby be recognized as Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and be it further proclaimed that all citizens learn the facts about breast cancer along with practicing a healthy lifestyle obtain regular breast screenings, uh, cancer screenings. Killingly Town Council, Jason Anderson, Chairman, dated Killingly, Connecticut, this 10th day of October. Proclamation recognizing October 2023 is National Bully Prevention Month. Whereas bullying is physical, verbal, sexual, and emotional harm or intimidation intentionally directed at a person or a group of people, and whereas bullying occurs in schools, playgrounds, neighborhoods, and through technology, such as the internet and cell phones, or often referred to as cyberbullying, and whereas according to national statistics, 28% of students in grades 6 through 12 experience bullying, a higher percentage of male students are physically bullied, where female students have the higher percentage of being subjected to rumors and exclusion from activities. 70.6% of young people have witnessed bullying. 16% of high school students were electronically bullied in the past year. And 55.2% of LGBTQ students experience cyberbullying. And 10% of the dropout student rate is due to repetitive bullying. And whereas targets of bullying are more likely to acquire physical, emotional and learning problems. And students who are repeatedly bullied often fear such activities like riding the bus, going to school, and attending community events. 
And whereas children who bully are at greater risk of engaging in more serious violent behaviors, in contrast to the children who witness bullying often feel less secure, are more fearful, and are intimidated. And whereas National Bullying Prevention Awareness Month is a month-long observance to educate and raise awareness about bullying, creating a safe, supportive learning environment, talk about bullying at home, supporting your community, and by asking for help. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Town Council of the Town of Killingly that the month of October hereby be recognized as National Bully Prevention Month, which further commits to support the safety of the children in our community. Be it further proclaimed that all citizens are encouraged to unite against bullying and to share the message that no one should be bullied. Killingly Town Council, Jason Anderson, Chairman, dated at Killingly, Connecticut, this 10th day of October, 2023. Thank you. Uh, and the last proclamation is Fire Prevention Month. Whereas Fire Prevention Week is observed each year during the week of October 9th in tribute to the Great Chicago Fire, which began October 8, 1871, causing devastating damage, homelessness, and left the city in mourning. And whereas in 1911, the 40th, 40th anniversary of the Great Chicago Fire, the Fire Marshals Association of North America determined that the anniversary be observed in ways to keep the public informed about the importance of fire prevention. Specifically, this is designated the week of October 9th, as this is when most of the devastation had occurred. In 1920, President Woodrow Wilson signed the proclamation for the first Fire Prevention Day, and in 1925, President Calvin Coolidge proclaimed Fire Prevention Week to be a national observance. And whereas the 2022 Fire Prevention Week theme is Fire Won't Wait, Plan Your Escape, the importance of planning your escape in case a fire is not just for schools, but for the entire community. Residents should take precautions such as installing new smoke and CO alarms, routinely check batteries and existing alarms, have a fire extinguisher on hand and have fire drills. These are all proactive safety measures that can increase fire safety. And whereas Killingly's fire departments and first responders are dedicated to reducing the occurrence of home fires and injuries throughout prevention education, and now therefore be it proclaimed by the Town Council of the Town of Killingly that the month of October hereby be recognized as Fire Prevention Month, we urge our residents to plan and practice your escape as well as utilizing everyday fire prevention for your safety. Killingly Town Council, Jason Anderson, Chairman. Moving on to unfinished business. Seeing none, move on to citizen statements and petitions. Does anyone here wish to speak on the public comment? Did we receive any? We did not receive any written. For that? Last call for public comment. Uh, seeing none, we move on to council staff and comments. Does anybody have any comments from staff or anything? All right. Appointments to boards and commissions. We have none. Reports from liaisons, Board of Education liaison. I don't see a Board of Education liaison here. This is a Borough Council liaison. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I missed you out for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> it's, been, it's been a long day. Welcome. Thank you. Just hit the Push button. the green button there. there a go. little button. All right. Thank you. Good evening. Um, the HVA system for the firehouse, the bed should be in this month. Um, I'm not sure if the walkthrough went well or not. Um, the Nomad Digital for our um, social media, we're going to use um, Danielson CT to tag with rather than going with Borough of Danielson. It's a lot shorter. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, approved the revised conflict of interest policy. We approved Hometown Heroes banner for a town. It's basically would be the size of the flags that the town hangs now. Mm -hmm. um, there would be no cost to the borough or to the town of Killingly. Um, Heidi will reach out to you to see if we could um, work it in where the town would hang the flags. Yeah, I did um, have a conversation with Heidi on that, so we need to just get together, and I think it would be probably good for um, the borough to um, have a conversation with our Veterans Council okay. um, for that program because I think that that would tie well with our Veterans Council. All right. And what else? Was <coughs> the other thing was um, the <laughs> borough audit audiences revisions were approved by the, the members also. That's all I have. That's all I have. That's all. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, no questions. 
Mr. Wood. The uh, hometown heroes. I think I have a kind of an idea of what that is, but could you ex explain it a little bit better? <coughs> what it is is it's a, a flag with a picture of uh, one of our veterans, mm -hmm. the rank, service, and dates. Um, that would be paid for by the sponsor of the person that wants to see the flag in town. The, the program actually doesn't. There's ones that are just veterans. There's other programs that open it up to, you know, anybody who wants to have a flag. So it doesn't necessarily have to be just a veteran. So, um, you know, it came to me from the um, one of your other council members. Xavier. Um, Xavier. I haven't had a chance to reach back out to him, but I did have a meeting with Heidi and kind of reviewed it a little bit with her. Um, so we just got to kind of work out what their vision and components are with that. And I think probably either coordinating them with our rec, uh, board of rec or with the veterans council to really, you know, iron out, you know, what's the criteria around the program? Like how do people access that and how many flags they're going to do and all that kind of stuff. Um, do we want to expand it beyond just the borough area? What does that look like? So I think that's really what it's to come down to but it probably makes sense for it to be in one of those uh, groups to have that joint conversation would, it, would it, they end up being like the ones up in Putnam similar very things? similar to that um, they're about the same size as the flags that we currently fly, that we currently have attached to the decorative poles it would be uh, similar to that um, awesome I think I think that's a great idea and I want to say thank you to the borough council for coming up with that it's, it's awesome actually I'll pass it along to them so those will get hung along Main Street on the... Um, that's currently what the proposal would yeah. be. Um, and uh, there's different, depending on how many, I looked at the uh, program briefly, depending on um, how many are ordered depends on the price point of each banner. So um, that would have to, you know, uh, be a, have to be established as to, you know, how many uh, we would be able to have. Well, you have so many light bulbs. <laughs> and then also how many, you know, Oops. what's the criteria? Because if you go into it with absolutely no criteria, you could have, you know, what if you have 100 people that respond, then how do you, how do you rank that, right? Like how, right. if you don't have enough polls, like how do you, how do you do that? So you just want to be cognizant of it and, you know, how do you structure that program? I think we'll have to limit the amount that can be put up. We will. <laughs> we'll have to limit that and then, you know, figure that out because we do put decorative ones up through different seasons. So what season? And I think recreation typically uh, manages that component of it. So we'll have to you know, just work with that. I mean, so. if we're trying to honor our veterans, I don't think we should be flying that flag in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> so. Right, yeah. right, yeah, that's what I mean. T a time yeah. it appropriately with what, you know, whether there's a certain, you know, whether it's, you know, during the month of October for, you know, Veterans Day, or is it, or November through Veterans Day, or is it, you know, in May through Memorial Day? Like, when, when do we want to actually incorporate that into the, into the program of putting up those banners so that way we're making sure that we are respectful <coughs> of that program and those that have purchased it because this is somebody that's purchasing those flags and then once they come you know what's the timeline of when they come down you know what happens to them i would assume that we would turn them over to whoever purchased them mm -hmm. at whatever point so you know we have to iron out those details right. and i think working with whatever body whether it's if it's really geared for the veterans then working with the veterans council on developing what does that program look like i think makes a lot of sense or working with the board of rec to develop that program more specifically it makes makes a lot of sense yeah. thank you i like that you're idea. welcome yeah. i think that would work out well because no matter how they put the flags around in circles in the entire davis park yeah i would i would think that would work out well with that yeah didn't think of that one <laughs> remember he flipped the months that he was doing that because the timing that he used to do it we used to get a lot of high wind and the flags kept getting pulled out and yeah. flipped all over the park so he flipped it to another month and I don't remember off the top of my head which months he has it I think maybe it is now June that he's doing it as opposed to doing it for Veterans Day in November maybe I think that's what it was but either way um, that's kind of what they're doing I'll pass the information on. Thank you. Thank you. Jump on board. Any other questions for him? All right. Thank you for coming. You're welcome.
Moving on to discussion and acceptance of the monthly budget reports. We had a motion to approve the summary report on general fund appropriations for town government. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Everybody review it and have any questions? Hearing no questions, all those in favor of accepting the monthly report? Say aye. 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 Those opposed? Anyone uh, abstain? Motion carries. Moving on to discussion and acceptance of the, month of, uh, the uh, object based adjusted budget for the Board of Education. Second. I have a motion and a second. And how about any discussion? I'll admit I had a question on it. I emailed Mary on today about the non-lapsing account, but I, after I sent the email, I thought it was for a different fiscal year. After a, you sometimes have to put things in writing and read it yourself and realize that you're. <laughs> that part does get pretty confusing, though. Yeah. I will completely yeah. admit that that is confusing. Does anybody have any questions or on that report? All those in favor of accepting it, say aye. Aye. Those opposed. Abstentions, motion carries. And we are uh, 13, town manager's report, if you will, Mary. Okay, so um, just to give you, I tried to give you an update on several of the capital projects that we have going on. So um, Owen Bell, I started there. Um, so dredging, as you know, that's uh, been put on hold as we await Army Corps of Engineers review and input on that, that ended up having to go through there. Um, again, uh, so once Army Corps Engineers provides the review and comment, then DEEP can go through their final uh, approval. DEEP, I will say, has been responsive. They've already kind of come back and forth with us a little bit on questions that we've responded to them on. But uh, we're both waiting for Army Corps' input on this. Um, so ho our hope is that we'll be able to move forward with that for next construction cycle for next summer. And again, we would look to be doing that um, after the red, white, and blue takes place, so we're not impacting that event um, for the um, 4th of July. Um, it would be, uh, we wouldn't look to begin that project until after that and cross into the fall. So um, we would look at the same timing. So hopefully Army Corps will um, respond to us. Um, the Owen Bell baseball field, so that field um, has been discussed um, for probably about two years now. The infield is, uh, has raised concerns about the condition. It is fairly deteriorated. There is a number of um, inconsistencies in that play, um, that, uh, play field area. Um, there's been some uh, um, independent, uh, not independent, but um, there's been uh, some individuals that have uh, uh, cursory looked at it. Um, we had we decided to have a full evaluation done of that field. So I attached that entire study that we had done on that field. We really wanted to understand what the concerns were with the field and what recommended options there were because it is it is our high school field. It's the field that's used by our high school and um, it is you know one of our star fields within the Owen Bell Park. So we really wanted to understand what were the deficiencies in the field. Um, is it just the infield that has deficiencies? Are there problems or concerns with the, um, with the outfield? Is there concerns with drainage? Um, all of that. So we had a really extensive uh, study that was done on that. The infield, um, the recommended um, solution for the infield. So the infield is definitely um, uh, in worse shape than the outfield. So the infield does need more immediate attention. Um, and the recommendation was to do a full uh, reconstruction of the infield skin and irrigation improvements on the infield. Um, that would um, be anywhere between, the cost was estimated between thirty-five dollars and $45,000. Um, that would require closing the field for um, three to four weeks. Um, but it has a life expectancy of that reconstruction of between 12 to 15 years, right? So we would have a pretty substantial 
use out of that. Um, the second option, which was not the ultimately re recommended option, but the second option was to just do a rehabilitation of what's there. Um, that cost is twenty to twenty five thousand, but only gives about a five year life. So when in looking at it, really the better investment is going for the full um, reconstruction. So uh, at the time, you know, we have had um, some conversations. There was a potential donor that we had outlined. Um, it's, this has been part of our capital improvement plan now for two years. We had out, we had outlined in that capital improvement plan there was the potential of some outside donor funds. So we are bringing. We brought this. Uh, this uh, report to that donor we're looking to see you know at what level um, they're looking to contribute um, and then from there we'll determine um, how much additional capital funds we would have to contribute on the town side but with this um, you know we were originally um, when this project was put on the capital improvement plan we were only focusing on the infield nobody was talking about the outfield so this report really gave us a view of what's the outfield look like because nobody's been talking about the outfield and so let's talk about what does the outfield look like? Well, the outfield has its issues as well. And well, for right now, it doesn't cause, you know, it's not cause for immediate concern. He, the consultant really uh, felt that the town should plan on, there's gonna need to be a significant investment in the outfield probably within the next five years. So, and that investment is substantially higher. It was about 375,000. So, um, a lot higher and a lot of that is because of drainage um, and the pitch of the way uh, that property is um, in order to be able to get the appropriate drainage off of that field so um, <clears throat> that I thought was really important to be able to capture into our upcoming capital improvement plans and just we need to get that on the radar you know this is truly one of our one of our gems in in Owen Bell Park you know we need to know what that investment cost is it needs to be going into the future um, with that, the uh, softball field is the next field, so I'll be looking to engage with this company again to look at doing an evaluation of the softball field as well. What does that field look like and at what thresholds do we need to start looking at making improvements on that field as well? Because um, we haven't really looked at these fields in quite some time. So the softball field is our next one. Um, any questions on the Owen Bell sections? When was the last time we did any significant improvements work or whatever on these fields? This has been forever. Yeah, um, I'm going to say that we haven't done any significant improvements. Um, I'm trying to think through the years. Um, I think we, d we did some fencing improvements um, along one of the fields. Back in 2012, I want to say there was a capital project around fencing, um, but I don't recall any real major um, reconstruction of any of our of, of this field at all. Or have we ever Since done anything of these? Whatever was there, we worked from that, and that's. Yeah, for the most part. I mean, there's been some, you know, uh, minor work as far as releveling the um, the baselines. You know, but nothing of any substantial structural improvement to the field. We've not really, we've not really done that. So it's gone. It's been quite some time. So they're due. They're, they're overdue, I guess. Is, uh. so, um, I had a question. Uh, how much was the study that you paid for? Um, it was uh, ninety-five hundred dollars. Ninety-five hundred. And, uh, and that study includes not just the study, but it also includes they're their developing a um, field a plan. management plan, yeah, plan yeah. Um, as well as they'll, it will include uh, the development of bid specifications for us to okay. go out to bid for the project okay. and project management, which means they will oversee okay. the actual project itself. So it's not just as part of that 95 as all part of that. That's great. Um, I just had a question too because I don't know much about that. So the high school uses part of it, and then we have all kinds of recreation mm -hmm. a as part of it. Uh, do people like pay a fee to use it, or is it just all of us that do the maintenance of any of it? Yeah, we do all the maintenance of it. 
um, and generally okay. there's not fees um, so there's associated. So no, there's no contribution from recreation Correct. or school or whatever? Correct. It's just no, the, the school doesn't, thing. yeah. Okay. Just the town maintains it. Thank you. Thank you. The, the only thing I'm, I'm looking at, um, this disclaimer fee, uh, disclaimer notice, and um, these guys take no responsibility for anything. Absolutely none. So you have to realize, with every study, it's a study, right? Until they get into construction, they can't necessarily know what you're going to dig up. I mean, it's just like when you walk through a building, when you're looking at, Ed, when you're looking at a concrete pad, and you give somebody a quote on a, con on a concrete, concrete pad that you're going to remove, you don't know what's underneath that. You can, make as many, you can make as many educated guesses as you want, but until you rip it up, you have no idea what's underneath it. That's essentially what has to happen here. It, they can, we can make as many educated guesses as we want, but until we start tearing into the field, it's like any other renovation. You don't know until you've opened the can of worms. Correct, or you, your groundwater could be substantially higher than what you originally forecasted it to be based on the samples that you had, right? There could be factors that you just don't have a way of knowing in a study, even though, I mean, their study was pretty comprehensive, even with a study as comprehensive as this, there's just not a way for them to know it all. Mary, on the irrigation audit, it says, given the highly variable soil moisture levels, blah, 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 it's advised that all fields have an irrigation audit to determine if the system is functioning properly. Yep. Is that part of the 9,500 or that would be on top of it? So they did do an evaluation of the existing irrigation on that field, but they did, their recommendation was to do all the other fields. Oh, so right. the, the, as we do each field, that would be part of those fields. So, so it would be in addition to, so like the so soft, leaf, yeah, softball field will be on top of that, but that would include so um, with the softball field, and I did get a price from them, and I want to say it was around 5000 to do the evaluation for the softball field because the field management plan will be very similar to the baseball field, so they don't have to rework the whole wheel for that. Um, but they would include the irrigation audit as part of that 5000 for the um, – for the softball field. So as we do each field, yeah. the irrigation is evaluated with it. Would they be looking for turf for the softball field? No. Okay. We're not looking. I specifically put that in this. There is no artificial turf looking at that for any of these fields. We are only, so it, uh, and, and I put that because a lot of people will read looking turf in here, yeah. and there's a lot of references to, tur to turf in here, but that is the traditional word for sod turf for grass turf is the word turf. It's not artificial. I wanted to everyone to be aware that this is not artificial turf. Yeah, because I know there was some conversation around like partial artificial turf. I don't remember where. Quite some so, time back, yep. Yes, and no, so there's no, sure no recommendation for artificial okay. at all. Yeah, I believe it was discussed about possibly doing the infield with artificial. Yes, right. right. there was That's conversation right. about that a couple years ago. Okay. And that was why I wanted to have this study done by a professional um, a third party, because we were getting a lot of um, independent opinions as to what could be done or how much something would potentially cost. Having a full evaluation like this done really gave us a very solid, broad, big picture of the entire field, but also um, what really needs to get done. And, you know, what would meet um, the needs for, they spend a lot of time with our park staff to really understand what's the usage, what's the demands, how frequently people are on there, what their current maintenance is of the field, to really get a good understanding of the fields. One other question, um, this says here ongoing maintenance, yep. uh, costs 12 to 15 per year per field. Yep. What are we spending? Do we? So um, I don't know how you can put a number on it. But yeah. Is there some so that's what their estimation is. And again, um, I didn't dive in too deeply on that cost only because, you know, that likely includes uh, man hours, labor hours associated with, you know, mowing the field on a regular basis and all that kind of stuff. We don't 
have to we're, we already have park staff on board within our budget so that's not going to be an added cost to us what we need to evaluate is what is the what would be the cost for any additional clay material that would have to be added to the mounds or added to the baselines on an annual basis um, and then any actual um, which we already currently do we currently do fertilizing treatments as well as um, pesticide treatments um, on the fields themselves which would all be included in that 12 twelve thousand dollar number so so a lot of that is already incorporated in what we currently do maybe I don't have that number handy as uh, to tell you how much we currently spend on specifically that field right now maybe maybe the point I'm trying to make is we probably haven't spent enough no I think honestly I think that we have spent adequately I think what the difference is is what I'm hearing through this is that um, a lot of uh, I think what we'll do differently is the uh, clay how we manage the clay in order to dry out the clay what a lot of places do especially on recreation fields is is they um, they mix in almost like a kitty litter type uh, material in order to dry it out quickly that's actually really detrimental to your clay um, and it actually causes ponding to happen even worse because you almost create like a cement base underneath um, it's unintentional but that and that's I believe similar to some of the material so there's different material handling which will change that will change some of our stuff going forward but I think that we have done really well in the ongoing um, annual maintenance that we invest in the field but you got to realize like you said earlier it's been a long time well, since we've done this and with the amount of use that these fields go through, eventually every field's gonna have to have a rehabilitation. You know, that was just the point is that have we, well, I don't know enough about this, but it, it, it's, I don't play, I'm not there, I'm not the kid, you know, the kids on the field, is there any complaints from them? Yeah, so the high school coach was the one that initially started the conversation of there was concerns about the infield. And there was concerns about getting it, you know, especially when it was wet, getting it dried out, that there's uh, divot points in it, um, and that there's, uh, they're losing, um, they're, there's uh, raised lip areas around the baselines that are, disproportionate from what the normal play is. I'm, I'm not a baseball player. I don't, I don't install baseball fields. But um, there was a concern around that and that he is, he is voiced as well as other coaches have voiced to him when, his, when their players play on, our, on that field. And so that was the ask was, is there a way to just fix that? And, you know, can we go in and soften those edges? Yes, but it's not going to actually fix it. Right, um, so it was better really to understand what's well, the real of, fix to this. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. There's a, there's a lot to this, and again, we haven't done a lot. We haven't, you know, maybe we should have been on on it a lot more. But that's something that, again, again, budget considerations. However, yep. you you, yep. you got to live within that means, and yep. this may it's just like the uh, the road study we did. That was there. Now we have something here. It's, it's out there, it's not us, not somebody in town, we got a professional, you know, came out and gave us some information, and, yep. but it gets a lot of use. I mean, that, that, and everybody likes it. I don't hear any negativity about Owen Bell, and you yep. know, whatever it is, maybe, you know, from a recreation standpoint, it's, everybody else wants to come here, so yep. um, we, we gotta make that work. Um. So if there's nothing else on Owen Bell, I can move back. I can move on. Okay, uh, Reynolds Street. You'll probably you've probably noticed that Reynolds Street has been closed to, to through traffic as we um, have begun that project. So Connecticut Water has completed their water main replacement from Broad Street to the box culvert area of Reynolds Street. Um, they cannot proceed past that until the box culvert comes in. The box culvert is due in mid November. Um, pending weather um, but the anticipation is that that box culvert will get replaced this construction cycle um, right now uh, PJF is in the road right now doing the sewer main replacements so sewer main is uh, getting replaced at the moment up again up until the box culvert bless you um, 
Hopefully that'll time with uh, the box culvert coming in. They will then replace the box culvert. And the reason why they can't go past that is because currently right now the water main literally bisects the um, box culvert, runs right through the middle of it. And the sewer main actually runs right through the bottom of the box culvert. So we've had to change some of the, the, um, the dimensions of the box culvert in order to keep the sewer main completely below it without having any impact to it and be able to get the water main to pass above it without actually bisecting it. So it's been quite the challenge in that road to get everybody to live happily ever after in, in the roadway and have Connecticut gas, have uh, Eversource gas be able to get up and down the street as well too. So um, once the box culvert is in, um, they will then make Connecticut water and the sewer will make final connections to Main Street um, and that will be completed. Coming next year, we will do the streetscape portion of the project, which is the sidewalk replacements on both sides. That will incorporate adding that defined parking on the park side and doing that small renovation, which will ultimately um, end in Broad Sh in uh, Reynolds Street being a one-way street going from Main Street to Broad Street. We've, been, we've had communications with the businesses up through there. Um, very positive feedback that we've gotten from them on that design. Um, so, uh, and I've met with, um, you know, we've had conversations with emergency services. Um, initially, they did have concerns about the one way, but with the pole relocation on Academy Street, they can now take the left out of um, the Danielson Fire Station, um, which, does, which means they now don't have to drive up to Broad Street to come down Reynolds Street in order to go south on Route 12. So now they can have they have a direct access to Route 12, um, and that has um, alleviated that concern. So um, I think we've worked well with all of the entities on that. But um, we're still, oops, sorry, we're still moving forward. And then that box cover is who knows how old? Huh? That box cover, who knows how old? Correct. They found the drawing. I don't know how old it was when they were going through the records. Uh, Alex was when they were doing the study and whatnot. And you know, it's been there. No one knows who really built it. Um, so we're left with a, a bag of worms. And this is it's a, old. Kind of a nightmare scenario. Well, we will get there. At least the street is short and. Yeah. You get an exit both ways. You know, went out. If it was a long street right. and someone had to go a mile to get on a, on a dead end or something, that would be on a closure. But this is this is worth it. And it hasn't been co closed completely. So it's closed to through traffic, obviously, but those that live on the street have ha been able to have full access. So um, they've been able to work through that. And they're going to, I mean, I know we, some of this is weather dependent there. We're getting closer and closer <coughs> to. I'm not going to say the word because I'll have people throwing eggs at me later. But, you know, that four-letter word that everybody loves in the winter. Um, I Even just driving through there today, there is a, a, thankfully I have an SUV, but it's a little rough driving through there. So are they yeah. going to patch it up before? Yeah, they will. They'll have that? to patch it all up and have it ready for uh, winter. Okay. Right? So, yeah, they'll have to make it because we need to plow it. Yeah. And yeah. we don't need to be plowing up the entire asphalt. Mm -hmm. So, yes, That's they'll have to close it up for the winter yeah, like I said it was just a little rough even today while driving through there right which is going to make it timing wise is going to be important because you know um, and that's why we have to watch timing as to when the box culvert comes in because asphalt plants close usually shortly after the right after Thanksgiving sometimes sometimes you can get it to the about the 10th or so of December but by then it's not much past that so um, we really have to be cognizant of that so that way they can make sure they can close up um, the next one is the bridges, which you did do the um, uh, extension resolution at your last meeting on, but um, the one on Valley Road, as I indicated, the one for Valley Road over Mashantuck, that one is under construction. Um, so the detour is, um, <clears throat> is up, and I did include a, a copy of the detour map in your, in your packet. Um, transparency software, ClearGov. 
We have uploaded our FY 2022 general ledger data because that is our audited data at this point. They wanted to use audited ones to make sure that they successfully received it and they were able to fully map it into their transparency software. So they've been able to map it. They are currently testing all of that data. Once that testing is completed, um, finance will transfer the FY23 data um, and uh, um, they will test that data also to be sure that um, they've received it correctly. They then will go through a training schedule with our finance staff so that finance can you know, learn the whole uploading portion and be able to also verify data is um, uploaded appropriately. And we expect that um, that application will go live on our website by the end of November. So that's the current timeline for that. Um, <clears throat> town website, um, as everybody has said, our website is terrible. Um, I, I don't disagree with anybody. It's a bear on the outside. It's a bear behind the scenes as well. So um, staff uh, um, and I have been evaluating other websites um, for potential consideration to move to another, a different website platform one. And we're being really cognizant of, you know, what is that patron experience going to look like? You know, one of the benefits that I have is by having um, a newer executive assistant, um, sh and she is familiar with websites, um, she really takes a look at it from the that outside public perspective because she doesn't necessarily know what we do in every single department, so where do I find this, right? So she really can take that kind of outside perspective look. Um, but as we go along, we may be looking to do some, you know, um, public information sessions on you know, what do people want to see and what's most important and, and how can we, you know, better reflect certain things. So, you know, we know that calendar and information on a calendar is priority and a huge importance. People look there. Um, and so we're looking for um, better ways for people to be able to identify easily on a calendar um, when it's a, a council meeting or a board meeting versus a recreation event. So they don't all look the same and you're not looking at it going, I don't even know what I'm looking at anymore, right? Um, how can we better make it easier for people to understand those things? So we're looking at a lot of different things on, on websites, but we've, so we've demoed right now too. Um, we're, we're getting quotes um, and we're still kind of, you know, looking at that, that industry just to see if there's other um, robust opportunities that maybe the town can take advantage of. Um, before, but once once we've m come up with what that recommendation might be to move forward, I'll have to be bringing it to fiscal subcommittee, so we can determine you know what what the cost ramifications might be and and how that funding may look. But um, but yes, uh, that's a, a priority focus, and um, I will say Ashley, my executive assistant, has been taking the um, point on that. Um, and then lastly, like I mentioned last week. Um, I did get a communication, which I did include in your packets, um, around the America tw uh, 250 Connecticut Commission. So July of 2026, the U.S. is going to celebrate its 250th anniversary of the signing of the, de of the Declaration of Independence. Um, Connecticut has formed a commission. They're looking for a liaison from Killingly onto that commission. But with that, I didn't know if Killingly wanted to form our own commission on what do we want to do locally for any celebratory events around that signing? And um, maybe appoint somebody from that commission to be a liaison to the Connecticut Commission. Um, so that was really um, just wanting to you know, get a direction from the council eventually on how to proceed if you wanted to look at forming a, a temporary um, commission on that and, um, and how I can, I can structure something to bring forward to the council um, later on, you know, at another meeting, but um, that was the request from the Connecticut Commission. Thank you. Uh, another question I have, um, the status of the data center purchase and sale agreement, has that been signed off or what is the... Yep, so the purchase and sale agreement is signed. The escrow has been funded with the first 100,000, um, so they're under, they're underway with that. They're doing, they're in their due diligence phase, so they're I actually, they had a site walk today of 125 um, to take a look at it. We're in the remediation process. Um, 
from the ARP funding that was uh, approved of remediating that property. Um, so they were taking a look at that remediating process. Uh, it's really just uh, metal pieces of crumped up, crumpled up cars that we're pulling out of the ground in really one location and some and some old tires. So that's really what it is. But, you know, uh, interestingly, uh, many times when you have sites like that, it's I, I was talking to our consultant uh, from Kenton Frost that is over is uh, overseeing that from an environmental standpoint. Typically, they are looking to see how much soil a site has to remove because of soil contamination. Um, and less about you know uh, metals like that. Um, this time around, um, the soil looks beautiful. Um, it's just got metal in it, but the soil itself, like there's no there's no sign of petroleum contamination. There's no scent of petroleum contamination. None of that that we've experienced thus far. So it's it's been a very interesting site because that's not typically what you find on a site like this. So it's been a very it's it's good because metal is easy for us to get rid of. It's not it's not expensive to get rid of. So um, we have a big pile of scrap metal that's going to go. Um, but uh, and, a, and we have a, a pretty good size, sizable amount of tires that are going to go. But we haven't run into any other concerns on that site. So they were out there today um, checking that, that section out. Do you have any status on Lake Road generating tax appeal? Are they still negotiating? And um, no end in sight? Uh, so I will be likely coming to the council again for um, – Discussion. We'll be uh, looking to go into mediation with them. And then, lastly, I guess when you're talking about the website, did we put money in the contingency for looking at this, or is this additional? That no, this w no, this is not something that we budgeted for within the contingency. But it could be something that the council decides to allocate contingency funds for. Um, typically, I do utilize usually look to um, you know in the springtime and allocating those funds but um, because we usually look to get past winter but um, still at the same time um, knowing how that this has been a priority for the council um, That's what I'm getting to this. That's and so it you know and based on the numbers that I'm seeing thus far um, I think that it could be something that could be doable within the contingency um, if the council felt that it was, you know, a, a reasonable use. So, um, again, we're waiting for still a little bit more information on that, but I'll likely be coming to fiscal subcommittee with that. Thank you. Thank you. So with the town website, um, I did notice recently when I went to look under boards and commissions, because I appointed somebody that the application is usually under to apply to a board or commission is usually right there. I see nothing that says vacancy anymore. Um, okay, I will check on that. The application, yeah. And this is one of the challenges that we've had with this website. Every, t and I know it, it sounds it, it, truthfully, I have fought this because it sounds like a cop out, but I, I <laughs> trust me when I say that it's not. When they push through an update, yeah. we have links that just disappear off this website gotcha. out of absolutely nowhere, and and it's. It's so frustrating on the back end because unless you are literally combing that website every single day, like two or three times a day, which nobody on our staff has time to do that, um, you miss that until somebody says, well, I thought this was on there. And then we're like, what do you mean? Yeah. It, it was just there. Yeah. And then you have to go in. So that is, the, that is one of our hugest challenges with this website. And when we call the company to say, what the heck happened? We get, near, we get no support, none whatsoever. And um, so that's, I will relay that and we will make yeah. sure it's back up again and yeah, we I, will I, get it fixed. I, I just, I was like, oh yeah, go right on the website. It's right there. And uh. It's my online channel 22 <laughs> <laughs> problem. <laughs> Drives me nuts. Yeah, I, uh, I will say that uh, when it comes to the website, I know that there is some frustration. Obviously there's, there's room for improvements, but as somebody who's perused many different town websites, we still do really well comparatively. It, yes. I mean, there are some that are a lot more bare bones. Ours does have a lot more robust, but it's well, just sometimes really hard to find things. Yeah, I, I think some of it is the we streamlined a little bit better there because I know I've tried looking at other towns' budgets before, and sometimes it's like digging and almost needing to do a FOIA request just because of that. 
because you can barely find it. So um, I got to say, we, we do pretty well with, with that, but definitely there is room for improvement, obviously. And we just found out that they're making new um, requirements for websites for ADA accommodation. Um, so, which I don't believe our current website will be able to be compliant with. So we're gonna have to um, modify completely the existing one in order to be able to meet new um, ADA regulations. Thank you. Um, just a couple things as far as, since we're talking about bridges, I remember the subject of the Cotton Bridge Road Bridge came up a while back. Where are we on on that? We are still awaiting formal funding notification from the uh, state and federal government. So that was a, that was submitted to the new state program that is um, 100%, well it's funded uh, through the federal and the state, so there's no local funding. There was, we submitted seven bridges into that program, four bridges, we got notified that we would be receiving funding notification and we've not received any funding no notification from the state on them. So um, the town engineer does periodically you know, like send in an email, hey, what's the status on this? Mm -hmm. And we have not gotten any formal um, uh, funding notification, meaning we're, we're moving forward with contracting. So um, we're still awaiting those documents to come from the state. And it sounds like uh, with it being a very new program, they're still working out how that program those program documents function. Okay. Um, and as far as uh, road improvements and water main work, uh, where are we at on the Ottawagan Crossing? So Ottawagan Crossing, um, I expect that that road will go, I haven't talked to Matt this week, uh, with regards to Ottawagan Crossing. My understanding is that we were anticipated to start Ottawagan Crossing next week. I don't, not, I don't know if that's been pushed off because of the additional rain because the contractor that was working on that um, was committed to uh, another project before this one. So, and I don't know, we did have a couple, we had quite a few days of rain there. So I don't know if he's had to push us off an additional week. Um, but I believe that the Connecticut water main work um, has been um, completed. But I will, I have to double check that and make sure, because again, okay. I haven't talked to Matt today on it. So okay. I know that they were underway with it. Yeah. I drove by there today. It looked like they had completed it. Um, but I want to be sure that it wasn't just a part of it and they still had more to go. Yeah. And a Connecticut water main, that's for the Frito expansion, correct? Or that's, is that separate? It's, it's for Frito, but not for their expansion. Oh, okay. Even though we're paving over it, yep. um, it's just... Yep, they would be responsible for any settling that occurs in that, in that uh, area. But I will say that I know that Matt was very focused on that um, as knowing that they were going to be getting ready to do that work and we were going to be doing our work right behind them. So um, I'll circle back with Matt on that, but I know that he was um, very focused on um, the quality of that trench and the quality of the compaction and the uh, and the um, pavement. Because when they did Maple Street, we had a, a winter. Correct. And that was at least a winter. That's, that does a lot, the three-star and everything else. Right. Really but again, we so I don't know yet still on the timing, and I can email you all the timing as I get an update from Matt on that. Um, now, I know Mary had brought up the uh, possibility of set starting up a commission for um, the, the 250th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Is that something we want to discuss now um, as far as so setting up a commission? You would need to add it to your agenda okay. for something to discuss. Okay. Um, if, if that's what you want to do, you can absolutely do that. Yeah. I just... A procedure. Yep. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. You can have the yeah. historian liaison uh, when they go to the history, the historical meeting. Um, I mean, they're already aware of it, and they could probably. Uh, I think their input would be 
valuable well, for us yeah. to organize something. Uh, well, I think that would be more our town historian than yeah. historic district. And it may be something that maybe your town historian coupled with your board of rec maybe right. might be the, you know, the mix. I'm not sure um, what that mix looks like. But again, I can look if the, you know, the chair uh, directs me, I can put it onto a future agenda and you guys can discuss yeah. what that makeup looks like. Yeah, yeah. I, I would agree with that. that yeah. We put this on a future agenda. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, then we can bring somebody at least people participating. It will yep. give them a chance tonight because nobody here. Yeah. Yep. yep. Who knows if someone might not be here in the future, but at least yeah. it would be yep. something. Yeah. All right. Any further comments? Seeing none, we'll move on in the agenda. Next item up is unfinished business for town council action 14A is consideration and action on an ordinance amending chapter 11 to modify the notice provision of the alarm ordinance. Uh, can I get a motion to adopt this? I'll make that motion. Motion has been made by Mr. Grandelsky, seconded by Ms. Barclay. Uh, Ms. Clory, could you go over this, please? Sure, so again, this is um, the revision to just the notification section that has to do with security alarms um, that, are, um, that have false alarms. False alarms are alarms when the security system goes off and the alarm monitoring company cannot locate or contact the alarm user and dispatches police and once police com conduct or conclude their investigation um, there is it concludes with um, no found uh, no that there was no potential uh, criminal activity or potential criminal activity Currently, right now, um, we only receive those notifications of the list of what those how many false alarms we get. We get that list from the state police. They're the ones that are the record holders of that information. We get it at the end after the end of the month. Um, our current language within that ordinance um, has uh, the town responsible for notifying an alarm user after each false alarm. We just physically don't have the capacity to do that because we don't get the reports from the state PD until after the end of the month. So this language uh, just recognizes what our, how we currently receive the information. Um, I will say that alarm users, when they register their alarm, they're given a copy of the ordinance, which includes all the languages about fines, as well as um, if, they, if they have only one false alarm in the month, they do get a notification, and they also get the notification about the, uh, the fines as well. So the fines are, you have three in the course of the year that are free after the third one. And when you get to the fourth one, then there are accumulating uh, penalties associated with that. And that's really because we are utilizing or exhausting uh, police resources for, um, un, you know, uh, for undue reasons. You know, uh, the police don't just show up to a, an alarm call, look at the building and go, oh, clearly this is a false alarm. You know, they have to investigate the entire grounds. If, if there's a window ajar, then they have to try and gain entry to the property and then sweep the building. And it can be, uh, it can be quite a timely um, process for them and only to find out that it was a sensor that the property owner knew about and um, it's gone off numerous times. So um, we find that our, for the town, the um, properties that tend to have multiple false alarms that ends up running into fine category is typically commercial properties. Um, and, you know, they do have an appeal process under the ordinance that they can appeal to me as to whether or not um, they want to get their fines reduced. Um, and we've had a number of conversations, but this is just changing that recognizing how we can act, how we notify of that. Um, no, I do have one question. I, I'm, I know we do have, as, when you register your alarm, yeah. you have to leave a person to contact, phone number, yes. way to get a hold of them. Yeah. Um, in a situation where if there's a property owner that hasn't done that, um, do we leave notifications on the property like a note on the door saying, we were here, your alarm went off? Um, it depends on if the officer has any of those in the car. And okay. I can't always guarantee that a police officer is going to have that because state PD may respond or town of Killingly police may respond. Okay. Um, so 
if the state trooper has something in their car that they can stick on the door they might um because they do have some of those but if they don't have it in their vehicle then they're they're likely not going to put anything up on the door um but you know um there has been times when we've had a property owner that does didn't even give their alarm company a contact person you know um and so we end up the t the town the police end up being the default for every single alarm because they can't they have nobody else to call and sometimes it's just that the cleaning crew went in forgot what the code was set off the alarm mm -hmm. and police are showing up at the building because there's nobody to call um th that's a, that's a waste of resources yeah. um and inappropriate you know that's an irresponsibility from the alarm user's perspective. They should make sure that they have an appropriate contact with their monitoring company. Um, so, uh, so yeah, you um, should have those. But um, I can't always guarantee that they're going to be able to stick a sticky on the door that says, hey, you had a false alarm. You know, you would think that your alarm company would have gotten a hold of you. I asked that question, too, at the... Uh subcommittee meeting mm -hmm. and uh, what they pointed out was the alarm doesn't just reset so eventually somebody's going to yep. come and see that it went off because yeah. yeah. I, I i had yeah. the same it thought will. jason you know like depends on the alarm eventually when you it may go into a silent mode like the security alarm system may put it into a silent but the user when they get there should eventually see that there's something on their panel that's blinking um so if, if they're paying attention to their panel at all, they should see that it's, like, if they walk in the next day and it's not armed, and they know they armed it the night before, you would think that you're looking at your panel. But, um, so, and again, you know, that's a, an alarm user. Are we going to send out uh, notices after we change it that it's changed? I can't remember what we said, Mary. Um, uh, no, we've been only sending out monthly notifications because that's all we can send out at this point. We can only send out monthly notifications. So we, I wasn't going to send out notifications to everyone. Um, it does get published in the in the paper. This ordinance revision gets published in the paper, um, so it would be notif noticed in that in that way. Is there a way we can have? Uh, a link to it on the website sure. as well on the front page yep. at least for a few months sure okay. I can do that plus of course that link disappears after <laughs> <laughs> well news I'll make sure it's up there all right I'll have Ashley check it all the time <laughs> any further discussion seeing none all those in favor say aye aye, aye. 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 opposed abstentions motion carries we'll now move on to the agenda Next item up is 15A, new business, consideration and action on a resolution approving the transfer of fiscal year 2022 to 2023 unexpended funds from the Killingly Conservation Commission, Killingly Inland Wetlands and Watercourse Commission, and Killingly Agriculture Commission appropriations to the Open Space Land Acquisition Fund. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, actually, I'd like to, since uh, 15A, B, and C are annual transfer, uh, can we do this in one motion? Yeah, we can do that. Um, so we will, uh, yep, so we are making a motion to uh, adopt the following resolutions being 15A, B, and C. 15A, I already read off. 15B is consideration and action on a resolution authorizing the transfer of fiscal year 2022 to 2023 unexpended funds from the unexpended department budgets to special reserve and programs. And 15C, Consideration and action on a resolution authorizing fiscal year 2022 to 2023 budgetary year end transfers. Can I get a motion to adopt all these three? I'll make that motion. motion has been made by Mr. Grandelsky, Second. seconded by Ms. George. Ms. Gloria, could you go over this, please? Sure. So the first one is um, in accordance to uh, one of our ordinances. The town council may transfer any of the unexpended funds from those three commissions to open space land acquisition. So this would transfer a little over $3,100 to open space land acquisition for um, the end of the year. And that again is the 
unexpended funds from those three commissions that were read off. The second item is uh, transfers that the uh, town has been doing for several years now from um, uh, certain departments to reserve funds. And so this is um, transferring funds from the um, highway public works divisions, highway supervision, central garage, and the highway department, and transferring that to C the CNR, capital non-recurring, um, to um, help make up the difference in market value. We've had a substantial increase in market value that our capital non-recurring fund doesn't have the ability to um, uh, recoup or uh, keep pace um, with being able to replace our vehicles. This is assisting with that. We've done this for a couple of years now. Um, and um, does that stay within the departments like it's yeah so it yeah. would be transferred to highway division vehicles so plow trucks dump trucks that type of stuff it it stays yes it all stays within that division winter maintenance uh, those funds are, are proposed to go to the winter maintenance reserve and that was because we did look at you know decreasing the salt uh, usage in the upcoming in this current year budget so um, moving to that and then law enforcement um, the remaining funds in uh, law enforcement to go to the constabulary reserve and that is as we continue to um, you know flesh out the uh, costs with the um, dash and body cameras and the data storage involving that and any of the residual impacts of uh, the police accountability bill with any additional uh, training and programs that we have to do um, that's what that is going to for that reserve so it stays within those components um, and that's why it's those specific departments because it goes to the reserves associated specific to their costs. Law enforcement is, is a CNR. It's not. It's no. like a separate reserve. That is a separate yeah. constabulary reserve. Correct. Um, and then the last, uh, the third item is uh, the um, the year-end transfers within the budget itself so this is within the operating budget so in the operating budget each budget if you recall each budget has three separate categories personnel contractual services materials and supplies um, the first section of this is uh, you know uh, for example I'll use the first one in the assessors the um, the contractual services grouping was exceeded by $12, but there's sufficient funds and personnel within the assessor's office to offset that. So the department as a, as a whole did not go over budget, but this is just cleaning up within the departments between those three categories um, for closing the books out. The second phase to this is there are some departments that did for varying reasons that are outlined here in the cover letter. Um, that did exceed over in totality the uh, total for the individual department. Um, we are we would be transferring funds, remaining funds from contingency, um, a little over fifty-one thousand dollars from contingency to all these remaining departments to zero them out for the end of the year. Um, and you know that's a pretty standard. Um, uh, that is the standard. Uh, uh, transfer that we do at the end of every year in preparation for our audit. So this is um, our final transfer request as we close out the books for our 2022-2023 before our auditors come in. So those are the three year-end transfer items. Thank you. I would just like to add that this did come before the fiscal subcommittee and the fiscal subcommittee did recommend um, approval of these to the full council. Yes. Thank you. I have a question like that's a high maintenance vehicle the, the the previous vac truck we didn't buy one because there was no money but basically we didn't have a there was something that was out of service for a lot i don't know do we put extra money so the vac truck is part of our cnr um and so but it's not due for replacement yet um and i'm trying to remember off the top of my head what specifically was the um repairs on that vac truck but that seems to be a higher end, re higher end maintenance. Or so it is a high. It, it does tend to have a higher cost when it comes to um, repair on the vac truck. Um, it um, the the motor when you're 
if I recall correctly, when you're sucking things out of the catch basins, <laughs> your engine motor is running at the same time. So your engine gets all get, gets high utilization even though it doesn't have a lot of Mi miles right. driven, right? And so it does have a lot of wear, wear and tear on the engine because we have a lot of catch basins that we clean out yes. and we clean them out all the time. Yes. We have a very regimented program in cleaning out our catch basins, which is very helpful in seasons like this with the amount of rain that we've gotten because we're not, you know, we're not having a huge amount of flooded roads, but um, it does put a lot of wear on, on that uh, vac truck. And so we do run into, you know, times that we are having to put some money into it. But again, a vac truck replacement would be, I think it's they're over $250,000. Yeah. So um, I'll pay I'll pay twelve thousand dollars for um, a repair on it, um, versus uh, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a new one. But Bless you. you. See, I don't know. Maybe it, it, with that particular vehicle with a high a high maintenance, do we put more money toward it, or this is the only way to do it? So we so part of what we do is with our CNR we have the cost of the cost replace or we have the original cost of the vehicle mm -hmm. and we've divided that by the useful life that's how we get the calculation for how much gets put in every single year for your cnr contribution right but we look at what's the wear and tear how is this vehicle surviving right it, you know sometimes a vehicle just doesn't perform well um and you know you're can't wait until the end of that useful life is there, right? Because it needs to go because you've sunk too much money into uh, repair maintenance. If that's the case, we look at the additional contribution, um, sh you know, should th this be approved with regards to the reserve, the money going into the additional money going into the CNR, we may focus that additional money into that vehicle so that way we know we can replace it sooner. If we feel that it's starting to accumulate too much in costly repairs, then we can move that CNR uh, replacement sooner so that way we can alleviate that every year high maintenance cost to the town in, in getting a, a better performing vehicle. So we look at all of those vehicles okay, within that category sense. and say, what makes the most sense? Because it seemed like the previous back truck was, we're dumping money and we should have bought a new one. And the previous back truck, if I remember correctly, um, it had a slightly different um, uh, uh, suction me mechanism that uh, burned out constantly. Um, I remember that thing being such a headache, um, and it did. It burned out constantly. I want to say we replaced the, that section of it um, probably one too many times. But um, this one, we went with a different um, mechanism on it. And uh, it has performed well, but again, it, I think it's we, tough, I want to say we bought this VAC truck was probably bought in 2014, maybe 2015. So it's been a while since we've purchased well, this VAC truck. that's kind of where I'm going. Is there enough, because it, it's, it, it wears itself out more than any other yep. vehicle. And it's like, just from what well. I remember it, it yeah, we had it. It's still in the fleet. It should have been replaced, and you're out there working, and it's not doing the job that it should have done. So, or how do we? Yeah, we always evaluate them when we look at additional funds going into CNR as to strategically what is costing us the most money. And now that we have the f with having the fleet management software where they're recording all the parts that are going into each of the vehicles and all of the repairs on each of those vehicles, they can really pull out and see. <laughs> this is spending a lot of extra money that they're not just going off of somebody's memory. You know, they're going by the data that's in the, in the fleet management system. It's a one of a kind, like we got plenty of dump trucks. If one goes down, there's, there's something else there to keep plowing, but this is it. So when it has a problem and it's not efficient, you know. It needs nice to be efficient. To look at it and say, hey, Maybe it's supposed to be three more years, but maybe we got to replace it now. Yep, that's something we look I'm at. Open I'm throwing that out. I don't know how that, I guess it has to come around here, but hopefully it makes its lifespan to, instead of being an efficient vehicle. Thank you. Um, on the, uh, the C, 
where you're closing out the books and 51,000 from different departments from contingency. So that is a separate type of process that doesn't affect our credit rating at all, taking Correct. from that contingency? Correct. Because this is our, so this is our annual budgeted contingency uh, expenditure line, right? So this is just within your normal operating budget and you're just transferring from within your op operating budget to elsewhere within your operating budget. So does not impact credit rating at all. It's actually um, our credit rating agencies uh, are um, pleased to see that we utilize a contingency account within our regular operating account, our regular operating budget, and that we do this process at the end of the year and utilize that. Oh, I, I think it's, I see. It's a separate line planning. item. It's not yes. your uh, it's general not our, fund. Yeah. yeah, okay. It's not fund balance. Not fund balance. This is planned for within the operating budget. Yep. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. We'll now move on in the agenda. Next item up is 15D, consideration and action on a resolution to adjust the town manager's fiscal year 23 to 24 compensation pursuant to annual performance evaluation. Um, the resolution is, uh, be it resolved the town council of the town of Killingly that the town manager has requested the sum of one hundred and twenty-five thousand four hundred. What? Where are you? Where are you? What are you looking at? No, I'm um, sorry, wrong page. <laughs> well, like, oh all right, God. glasses. <laughs> there we go. There we go. I apologize. Helps if I break out the reading glasses. <laughs> <laughs> All right, <laughs> so consideration and action on a resolution to adjust the town manager's uh, fiscal year 2023-2024 compensation pursuant to annual uh, performance evaluation. Um, the town manager did have a discussion with um, the vice chair and myself last week, and she is looking for a 2.5% uh, increase. Um, this would be consistent with uh, the a lot of the other town staff. So that's where this 2.5% number came from. Um, I will open up for discussion, question, comments. Would you like a motion first? Sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> a mo motion to accept this? <laughs> I'll make a motion to accept uh, uh, the uh, consideration and action on a resolution to adjust the town manager's compensation pursuant to the performance evaluation. Motion has been made by Mr. Gratula. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Ms. George. Um, I will open up to council members for discussion. I just wanted to uh, kind of remember last year. Last year, your raise went somewhere else. Is that correct? Yeah, last year I requested that any increase that I was contemplated for be um, instead distributed to the town hall unit staff because they are, their negotiated increase was uh, substantially lower than all the other employees and I felt it was important to bring them up closer to the other employees so they took a half a percent increase um, based on uh, taking any increase that I would have received and distributing it to them thank you and I believe the year prior you had requested a two and a half and the council actually approved a three percent and I was also, because your evaluation came in around two and three quarters, correct? Yes. Yes, so you took less than him. Well, so the, the, the ranking was the 2.75. Yeah. That was what the ranking right. was, so but it would be so up to the council. So you only requested the 2.5? 2.5 is the same percentage. I've only requested the same percentage as what all the other staff was receiving. Okay. Um, well, there you go again with that amazing leadership. Thank you, Mary. Any other comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. <coughs> we'll now Thank move you. on in the agenda. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Next item up <laughs> is 15E, consider consideration and action on a resolution to approve participation and the Connecticut Consul uh, Conference of Municipalities, CCM, Electric Consortium Program 
to competitively bid electric generation rates and authorize the execution of a multi-year agreement up to 36 months for said rates. Uh, can I get a motion to adopt this? So moved. Motion has made, been made by Mr. Wood, seconded by Ms. Barkley. Um, I will add that this also did be come before a fiscal subcommittee, and <laughs> fiscal subcommittee did recommend that the full council adopt this. Uh, Ms. Cloria, could you go over it? Thank you. I forgot to put that on the cover sheet <laughs> again. <laughs> so, um, so the town the town has participated in CCM's competitive bidding for electric supply for a couple of decades at this point in time. Um, we're getting ready to uh, come to the end of our current uh, lock-in for electric supply, so it's time for us to go out to bid. Um, and my request is to go up to 36 months because uh, once we do the bid, there's only a, a narrow window of time in which for us to lock in that rate. We only have a few hours to confirm that lock-in. And since if we do choose to do more than a one-year time period, I do have to have the authorization from the town council in order to lock in beyond 12 months. Um, the analysis that's attached to this is what um, the analysis that um, Adam Taff from Titan Energy, which is the um, which is CCM's consultant that um, runs the procurements for the electric supply. Um, this is the analysis that they had done for us uh, back in September. This is not the rates that we're going to lock in at. They have to redo that whole procurement, but it gives us the window of what it what's the potential opportunity. And so, based on this one, you know, it does look like the 36 month rate um, would be the best um, alternative for the town. It could still be 36 months when we run it uh, right after this is completed, or it may only be 24 months, right? But this will give the flexibility for us, uh, for myself and the finance director to really evaluate those prices as they come in and determine what is uh, the best opportunity that the town can lock in for. I do have one question and I didn't think of this during um, fiscal sub. So when they're predicting the rates three years out, are they, what are they using? Like ISO New England's three year forecast as far as the auction to bid power, to buy power yeah. three years out? Yeah, okay. they're using all of those components and you know, they're magic crystal balls. To figure out what what pricing is going to look like back then, they use what our energy consumption is. One of the other things that, uh, with evaluating this, they will submit uh, all all companies will have to submit terms and conditions, um, and Titan Energy will assist the town in evaluating all of those terms and conditions. One of the one of the terms that we have seen on previous um, bids that. Um, we have had to uh, push back on is if the town reduces our energy consumption by a certain percentage, then we um, have penalties within the agreement, right? Clearly, the town doesn't want to participate in an agreement like that because we're always striving to do energy efficiency projects. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to run into, oh, we can't do that energy efficiency project because of, uh, of an, ener uh, an electrical lock-in rate, right? So that's what we're looking for, and we're always trying to be cognizant of what are we, what type of projects or programs are we attempting to participate in. Um, so that's the types of uh, terms that we always trying to dig through in that, you know, two-hour window that we get or three-hour window that we get to evaluate these. Um, and I will say, uh, Titan has been very good about making sure they point out the you know this is this is a benefit and this is a detriment you know know that here's the good here's the bad here's the ugly um they've been very good about that thank you questions comments seeing none all those in favor say aye aye aye, aye. aye. opposed abstentions motion carries we'll now move on in the agenda Next item up is 15F, consideration and action on a resolution to set the date of November, November 14, 2023 for a public hearing on the proposal to authorize the town manager to expend up to $150,000 of American Rescue Act funding for the Housing Authority Elevator Renovation Project. I'll uh, make that motion. I'll second. Motion has been made by Mr. Grandelsky, seconded by Mr. Wood. I would add this did come before the fiscal subcommittee and the fiscal subcommittee did recommend um, that the council approve this. Um, one thing I will add is 
this figure is slightly different than what the Housing Authority first came forward with, and the figure they had first come forward with did not include any money for um, dealing with uh, possible necessary upgrades to the control room, um, similar to what we had happen here in the town hall where our elevator project, the control room, they actually had to put, I believe it was the mini schools. splits. It was the, some of the school oh, the, projects. Oh, the school, that's right, the Westfield app. We haven't upgraded our elevator okay. here yep. at the town Not hall. yet, not yet. Don't get ahead of yourself. Okay. That one's got to yeah, still it, come coming. to us. <laughs> it's coming. Um, but we had an elevator project at the Westfield Lab School yes. um, where the control room, they had to put mini splits in to control the temperature in the room due to the upgrades yep. um, to the control system. And rather than having to, the housing authority have to come back for more money afterwards, um, we recommended to put this in there. This should cover um, the potential cost of any upgrades that are necessary. And, and to that extent, we um, that the number that we derived at the 150,000 is very similar to what was expended on the elevators. The two the two elevators were done and the school project in the non-lapsing. So our finance director was very familiar with those numbers and the additional costs associated with having to add that um, HVAC component to those mechanicals. And so both of the elevator projects that they did um, through the non-lapsing originally started at about $100,000 and ended at about $150,000. Um, so the recommendation was the 150000 for the housing authority's um, elevator. And again, so this is their, um, this is for their Maple, two court, Maple Court 2 congregate housing facility. That's the multi-level facility. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they've had several times that that elevator has gone down. Um, the parts that are in it right now are becoming more and more challenging from that, for them to be able to find replacements on. Um, and as you can well be, you know, well guess that uh, elevator is critical for that facility, critical for the um, residents that are in that facility. So doing this um, upgrade is, is really a very uh, necessitated item. So, but at the same time, they are, they are fairly restricted by the state as to how much for the congregate housing facility they're allowed to keep in a reserve account. Um, and so they don't have the capacity to invest this type of funds into that. Um, so that's where the request came from. Um, originally, the a housing authority had uh, sent a letter requesting uh, paving um, after having our highway director go out there and uh, evaluate the paving um, and the condition of the existing paving. Um, crack sealing would um, not be very beneficial to do. His recommendation was really wait a few additional years and just go for a full replacement of the parking lots. That's really, they're, they're at the tipping point where crack, crack sealing is gonna really be a waste of money and you might as well just give it a couple more years and then let it be a full re replacement on that. Um, so he did give me some um, numbers around that and that's something that I can probably include in the upcoming budget under capital for the town to consider. But uh, this uh, more critical item uh, came to my awareness through our fire through the fire marshal um, and so I reached out to the executive director at the housing authority to say hey I, maybe this might be the opportunity to put in for an ARP application um, under an emergency basis to the town council for consideration thank you Mr. Grandelsky yeah, That's a that's a, a benefit to the town. That is such a benefit. It's, I can't say enough about it. It's really and it's a great run operation. But the, the rents are, are so tight and everything sub you know subsidized or they're they're matching funds for the tenants. They don't pay the full amount and the state keeps telling them they should raise their it. This will help them in a, in a lot of ways. And that that elevator, the, the population is up. And I don't think it ever stops. <laughs> uh, it's just a constant. When my mother was there, uh, you know, it, it's anytime you run it, it's it's going, it's up and down, up and down, and I think <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to be, you know, moving something that often. And it's it's held up, but they're pouring a lot of money into it. So this is a very beneficial uh, uh, proposal. 
I agree. Thank you. Michelle? Um, where are we at uh, unexpended ARPA funds? It's so the, the second page we have <laughs> remaining unallocated right now is a little oh, over 1.8. Sorry, Beth. Well, that's okay. A little over 1.8 million. <laughs> um, and again, these funds have to be appropriated by December of 2024. Um, I did list on that page also the two applications the town council has not yet acted upon, which I had requested at that time the council not act on all of the applications, only because we were waiting for uh, some of these. Um, capital projects to finish up so that way if there was any residual funds the council was going to be doing one final um, allocation of those funds so there was still some residual and you know the town did have a very specific um, application process that we initially opened and then closed um, so while we're outside of that application process this was viewed more as an emergency need from our housing authority um, and that's why we we brought it through thank you I, I just want to uh echo what Ed said I think it's a great idea you know to me that's what the money is for yeah. but thank you thank you mr. wood yeah I again uh, one thing that was brought up by uh, Carol at the fiscal sub is that should this elevator ever truly go down um, they're literally evacuating the second floor because they cannot have tenants uh, residents up there at yeah. all it's a safety issue at that point and i don't and, know where those residents would go and that's yeah. exactly it so yeah. there's no housing for them to go to right yeah. i mean it's they they're helping out folks that uh, as uh, already been mentioned they've been told you know you need to raise your rates there and um you know people can't afford two thousand dollars a month or, or more um yeah. and they're doing a great job of trying to keep it income based and help out folks there to have somewhere to live um so and also help keep them out of a, a convalescent home which would cost well more than two thousand dollars a yeah. month um so I, I think that this is definitely a um, worthwhile investment to help uh help them out thank you any more comments I just, oh, um, carol did talk about when the elevator was down that there was one resident um very large where they had to call the ambulance to um, try to get that person to the second floor. They, it was very, very difficult. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Seeing no further comments, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. We'll now move on in the agenda. Next item up is council member reports and comments. Uh, Mr. Grandelski, could you start? Uh, Conservation Commission, they were talking about their walks. Uh, they're talking about possibly they have three different bus tours, mini bus tours. They were looking at creating a fourth one, um, but all the bus tours are all, whenever they have them, they're sold out. Um, they're very, 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 very popular. And um, they're still looking at the, um, at the, Chase, uh, the Chase property where uh, the um, forest management plan, there were no takers, so I don't know what we're going to do over there. That's getting to be a bigger issue because more. Yeah, we're going to need to uh, re put that out to bid for forest management. We've gotten some feedback on why we didn't receive any proposals under that forest management, and I think largely it had to do with timing. So um, I think that one will need to go back out to bid, and hopefully we'll hit a better timing point to be able to get some proposals on that. And then we're looking at that. We also got other properties, but that's the, that has to be, you know, taken on right away. And even some of the others, we're not doing enough maintenance or forest management plans on those. So that's all I have for that. Thank you. Mr. Wayhead? I have none. Thank you. Ms. Murphy? I attended the uh, wastewater meeting. Um, they had one fecal violation because of rain. It looks like a... Maybe the blankets popped and went over the weir. Um, most of the discussion was about increases still. They're trying to do it. I think they scheduled uh, their next meeting is going to be a public hearing uh, for increases for the hookup, if the public is interested in that. <coughs> so that's this next Wednesday. Yeah, and I think <laughs> that um, we might be having to put something on the website. I believe that that's going to get delayed by a month okay. um, because of uh, lack of quorum. And just so everyone is aware, uh, 
Anne Marie's husband, Don Aubrey, who was on our WPCA. He was the one that passed away. Yeah. A great, great person. He will be missed. Um, the pump station uh, that they had replaced a couple of pumps. I think they said they were almost done with that, but maybe they said it's up and running. I can't remember what they said. I think that one's up and running. Up and running. And then Reynolds Street we talked about. And uh, the only other thing is that I remember is they're going to stop taking septage because their uh, screen went down and they really, it's not worth the cost to uh, build another one, bring in another one. Thank you. Mr. Wood? Uh, fiscal sub, we had items 15 A, B, C, F, and G are on there, so like, we've discussed them all. Um, uh, historic district, we met with them last week there, and that's pretty much essentially my report from them. Um, but I'm not getting off this easy. <laughs> um, I did meet with the town manager and Ms. George, too, recently. Um, NECOG had resurrected the Holdsworth study, which was a studying on the pre uh, on EMS in the region and essentially discussing regionalization. So uh, if you, any of you are interested, I have a wonderful 15 page document on really anal my own analysis of that from when it was done back in 2018 till now and how things have changed and some of the, both the deficiencies and the strengths of that study as well. Let me tell you, I spent a lot of time in that. Uh, but I did meet with Mary, and we were discussing uh, some of that as well. Uh, and I met with her last week to talk about that. On that, I think that's it for me. Thank you, Mr. Cadul. Uh, <clears throat> I was on the fiscal subcommittee meetings that we've discussed, and uh, the permanent building committee had a walkthrough that I didn't make that because of fiscal subcommittee. But I made the regular meeting, and they're they're still on time and on budget, and uh, still moving moving ahead. Uh, a lot of progress over there being done. That's good to hear. Um, again, I was on fiscal subcommittee. Um, we already discussed everything that went over. We went over on that. I uh, did remotely attend the Inland Wetlands Water Course Commission meeting. Unfortunately, uh, coming straight here from work, I did not have time to grab my notes from home. What I can do is email my notes to everybody. That way, you know what went on at that meeting. Ms. George. I attended the um, my first Board of Ed meeting this year. Michelle covered for me. Uh, the last time so some of the new thing I will say dr. Nash is doing an amazing job the energy when you walk into that meeting is just it's so relaxed it's so uplifting it's really positive and she's got some really great things going on um, so she first she spoke about the teacher appraisals program update so last year 2022 they focused on cognitive engagement this year they're adding in a new piece um, that is peer observation so Miss Lydia had a concern about any personal bias or subjective colleague behavior that could kind of skew um, the results. But Dr. Nash explained these assessments are based on the actual lesson being taught and not the way it's being taught. And people are more, um, more comfortable, I think, getting feedback from their peers. And I know in a lot of corporations, they use this kind of action planning peer feedback. So they're looking to see it so it's based on the outcomes of the actual um, lessons so we'll see how that goes but it sounded like a really good idea uh, the National Junior Honor Society and Mr. Morrill um, came in there were three young ladies from KM, uh, KIS they did a wonderful job uh, they talked about a program called start with hello um, and it's a program to welcome and mentor the younger students so the fifth graders um, and it's 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 basically the whole school inclusive but the National Junior Honor Society has started it and what they do they showed um, some pictures sorry where they put like um, like little sticky notes with all kinds of positive information for the kids um, they help you know help them you know if they can't find a class or they say good morning they're they're just the older kids are just so welcoming and positive with the younger ones. I think it probably helps with bullying, stress, anxiety. It's a great program. Um, they also talked about, um, they, they mentioned Rachel's Challenge and how they've implemented that. And the National Junior Honor Society members are all trained in the Sandy Hook Promise Program, which also goes towards helping you know, with bullying and so on and so forth. So really good things going on. 
Um, she talked about being uh, awarded three different grants. So for Title I, um, the funding will be used to cover summer school and SE programs to alleviate budgetary needs. So instead of putting like summer school into the budget and you know asking for more money, they're gonna use uh, the leftover ESSER funding. Uh, Title II, um, re a grant they received to reduce class size and for professional development in reading and to cover the cost of tutors. And Title III for English language learners and that will fund a salary for a KCS English tutor. They conducted every few years, they do the safety drills, um, and it was conducted with our SRO and ASO staff and Connecticut State Troopers. Um, it's the Run, Hide, Fight program. So the style has been updated. Um, it, it used to be kind of scary for kids, but now they have changed it up to it's more engaging and less scary. So they work more, um, I, I understand what she meant. It's, it's probably less like intimidating for the kids because obviously it's to you know, train in the case of an emergent degree, school shooter, that kind of thing. Um, but it, it, it's, um, it's a way to get the kids prepared, but also they've changed it so that it's not as intimidating and it's not going to create more fear in them because they're working together with the officers. They also changed the color drills. They've ch been changed to a step-by-step -step plain language protocol because what they have found that in the event of an actual emergency, the codes, someone might not remember what that code is. So the plain language is much easier and quicker for people to think of. It's, it's much more clear in an emergency situation. Um, it's important to note KPS received very high reviews on the safety protocols um, and they did make some suggestions. So film for windows to make them bulletproof and then they are going to use some funding to get walkie talkies through a, uh, update their walkie talkies so the communication is throughout the whole district. They can talk to each other. Um, and there was a transfer request to support uh, KHS World Language Virtual Learning Program and there's also 22 students who are going to be attending um, classes over at QVCC. So they'll be going over during um, like the end of their day to have actual classes on campus as a group. So they'll get transferred over. Um, Lydia had some questions as to, are they gonna miss any extracurricular activities at the school? Is it gonna break into like their, you know, if they play football or have a sport or something? And the way it's, they have been able to organize each student's individual schedule to accommodate everyone and make it work. So, like I said, really good things going on over there. Um, and then I did attend NDDH today, my first time, um, and there was a vote, it was mostly executive session, but there was a vote to send out a potential agreement with a staff member that had been terminated. Um, they have 21 days to review that. Can't say any more, um, but we did, after we came out of executive session, um, did discuss there, there needs to be a meeting sooner than their scheduled November 9th meeting to discuss the ongoing issues and the no vote, um, voted no confidence that NECOG sent over from all the uh, different towns um, in relation to what's going on over there. So we'll see how that turns out. Um, keep you posted um, and then as Ray mentioned the NECOG meeting um, we did receive some information that EMS program which I think needs to go right back to the drawing board but um, there were some updates on legislation so there are some changes with the animal services program um, two public acts that people can look up but they have increased um, a per diem rate on animals that they're holding they are able to now charge um, someone who they take an animal from and it's in their care, they can charge them for the vet costs. Um, and then ARPA money can now be used to cover um, matching share grants for infrastructure, any community development things like a senior center, um, housing rehab, so on and so forth. And that's an opportunity to keep taxes down um, and that for the towns, use the leftover opera money, but it can cover for bridge match, low sub engineering, 
bonus funds for town aid roads, community connectivity, bikeways, trails, you name it, they can use it. And that's it. Thank you. Ms. Wakefield? One quick comment. I did, uh, Dr. Nash, I really like the fact that she's going on the radio the once a month. To yeah. She's making herself accessible and answering questions, and yep. I think that's she, great. Yeah, she's definitely decided that she, she's articulated to me that she wants to attend whenever I go on Winnie. So um, she's been coming with me mm. um, for pretty much every one. And, um, you know, I forewarned her. I open it to um, calls, so <laughs> be prepared. Um, but she's been doing great. She's been doing really great, uh, um, uh, you know, at being accessible like that. So, yeah. Could I add to that? I, I forgot I attended that meeting, uh, the first one. So, and correct me if I'm wrong, Patty, but I think they're fully staffed all except for 12 people. Like, yes. they, they hired all these people. And then the counseling department is fully staffed now. And they got raving reviews from Kathy Cody, uh, the head of the mental health department. And the bus drivers uh, have two more to be trained, and then they are fully staffed with bus drivers. So I forgot. Oh yeah, that I went to it's that. It's a total turnaround. They're doing phenomenal. She she's wonderful. Did she give you a list, or did she, they mention a list of which buildings they were looking to have the windows done in? I did not see that. In That's the packet, fine. I'll I'll reach out to her because okay. we've done a number of those buildings already. Oh okay. So um, yep, I just just curious as to whether or okay. not that information's been relayed fully or gotcha. um or what because I I'm ticking off in my head all the capital projects that included uh, impact resistant windows oh, on them. Okay. That um, was the so first time I heard of it and I was like taking she talks really fast so yeah. I've taken really fast notes. So but we've yes, already done I it in a number. I think she mentioned the yeah. n which ones are done yet. Yeah, we've already done a number of them. So I'll reach out and make sure that we uh, which ones still need to be I have to go back to shorthand. <laughs> She's <laughs> very thorough. I understand. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the Board of Rec met on September the 25th. Um, they discussed uh, what Mary already brought up about the baseball fields. Um, they also were talking about different capital um, projects. Um, they're looking to replace the swings because those do eventually wear out. Um, the, the money that has been donated for the pavilion in honor of Joyce um, should be going up in the springtime. Um, they're also s continuing to research and look into doing a pickleball, um, updating the splash pad and the splash pad grass. I know they were talking about doing one, a splash pad that's more toddler friendly, um, rather than it's rather than big dumping water, which scares the little little guys. Um, probably scares some of the big guys too. Um, they were working on getting a grant from the um, the Lions Club. Um, I believe it's the national one uh, for upgrades to Lions Park on Morin Ave. Um, so we got to discuss that a little bit. Um, fall brochures, um, youth hoop. Um, they had at that meeting had already had 214 um, people sign up for youth hoop. Uh, so when we talk about our baseball fields being uh, used a lot, um, we have a lot of participation. They said their first day of open registration for Youth Hoop, they had the most people, most kids sign up, 104 kids signed up in the first day. So um, it's definitely a, a good program. Um, the Spectacular Light and um, Sight Parade, as of the 25th, there was already 25 participants for the parade, which they were, which is what they wanted, um, went over that the trick or treating is from three to five, and then four to six there'll be stuff in in Davis Park, and the parade itself is supposed to step off at 6:15, starting in Westfield Ave, and going down to St. James. Um, the Little Theater on Broad Street has a lot of stuff coming up. Uh, their Christmas. Um, show is actually they're going they're looking to do a matinee on the saturday and not just the sunday so they're looking to do a saturday matinee and the saturday night show um just to see how that goes and uh, the springtime they're looking to do the gene wilder version of willy wonka 
and um, for Valentine's Day, they're going to do their singing cupids again. They, they, I guess that went over really, really well last year, so they're looking to do it again. And summertime will be steel magnolias. Um, and when the program they started last year with the Frozen, where they invited you know youth school groups in to see how how a theater runs. They already have eight out of district schools interested in coming to um, for to do their theater orientation kind of stuff. So, and they're also looking at doing a sensory friendly show um, for kids that are on spectrum and and have other um, can't s sit in like a regular performance. Um, the last thing they brought up was that they did. Um, find a rec supervisor um, that was supposed to be starting the second, I'm assuming he has, um, Tom DeRosier um, was, was put into that spot. The name's familiar and I'm, for some reason I'm just blanking on, oh yeah, so, um, so anyways, he's, he's in there, um, he took over for Gunner, who went um, down to another opportunity, so, and that's, pretty much it. Thank you. Ms. Barclay. From the Planning and Zoning Commission, um, the 552 Hartford Pike um, a project by Owen Bell, the public hearing and the special permit was moved to October 16th. Um, they're looking at trying to um, make changes to the project um, without the um, extra um, easement. And um, Upper Maple Street Colonial Drive, low density um, planned residential development with 16 duplexes with 32 homes on 6.57 acres. Um, Colonial Drive, Upper Maple. And on Two Weeks Lane, um, they want to divide lot 30.1 30 30 um, with uh, into um, two parcels and then move the lot line of lot 30 to um, um, create a conforming lot. Um, there's going to be a public hearing on October 16th for a zone text change to allow a redemption center in the borough of Danielson Central Business District. Um, 543 Warregan Road request um, zone change from light industrial back to general commercial. That's the building that um, Benny's was in. And um, there's going to be a public hearing on October 16th for 18 Ware Road and 21 Pineville Road for a medium density housing, 14 single family rental units with a community building on four acres. Currently, 21 Pineville Road has one duplex and 18 Ware Road is 3.7 acre lot. I don't know what it's currently zoned for. Um, from the Housing Authority, um, as of August 31st, there were 222 applicants on the waiting list. There were three vacancies from one death, one went to a nursing home, one <coughs> went to live with a family member, and then uh, most, a lot of it was um, the elevator that went down on August 16th, and then um, the fire alarm contractor in Otis Elevator. They coordinated a mandatory test of the um, fire shunt relay in the elevator uh, maintenance room, and um, it shuts off the water if the alarm goes off. But in 2017, um, they received $27,000 in the Small Cities Grant for wiring and installation of the shunt, but during the inspection, they found the wiring was there, but the shunt was never installed. So they were waiting for the bill because Otis was charging five hundred dollars an hour. <laughs> yeah. And um, the estimated um, cost for the repair was ten thousand. And you and what you had said that they, um, Carol thought it would be about ninety thousand for the um, 
elevator upstairs. Thank you. All right. At this time, we'll move on to the agenda. Item 17, we have nothing for executive session. So item 18, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion has been made by Mr. Grandelsky, second by Mr. Wood. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? This meeting is adjourned.